everyone. Welcome to the continuation of the Cruise Consulting Venture Capital Pitch Deck course. This is our free online course available on YouTube and on our website at cruiseconsulting.com slash pitch dash deck. K-R-U-Z-E consulting.com pitch slash deck. We're going to be talking about the traction slide here. Uh, as always, I am with my wonderful co-pilot and partner, Haya, who is a well-known pitch deck consultant and tech crunch a journalist and also a company. He's founded multiple startups. He's raised venture funding. He's been a venture capitalist. So um, I've been a VC. I advise a lot of companies raising money. I've worked for startups. So we're not going to go through the details of who we are. We've done that in previous um, parts of this course. You can bloop back to any of those to see who we are and why we're here. But let's dive in. Let's talk about traction. Love it. Who is this slide for? Him? Good hands. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think the traction slide is actually super interesting. Um, I um, I talk to all of the people I work with, all my clients about uh, the traction slide, and and kind of the the rule of thumb is if your traction is amazing, front load it. Um, in in um, in this kind of universe, like if you have traction, you need nothing else because every other weakness in your company, you know, if your team is kind of so-so, if everything, if your product is so-so, it doesn't matter. If you have incredible revenue metrics and incredible traction, clearly it doesn't matter that these things don't work, right? And the reverse is also true. If you have the best team in the world and you have the best product in the world, but you can't get traction, it's, it's a hard argument to invest in you because clearly something isn't working. Traction is such a beautiful, um, or the right kind of traction is a beautiful um, sh like proof for whether or not you have found uh, your product market fit. And so that's where this slide is so important. That's right. And so this slide makes up for a lot of problems. And in fact, with this slide, you can probably fundraise to the extent your traction is legitimate and amazing and growing. Yeah. So I was talking about the up and to the right chart. The VCs like to see the up and to the right chart because then in their mind, they can extrapolate that up even, even further. Um, every company is going to have different, or not every company, but different industries have different KPIs that will go into this. We're going to get yep. into that. Um, but one of the things that I want to make sure we emphasize here is that there are going to be companies that are fundraising that don't yet have traction. It's not unusual for a pre-seed, an angel round, maybe even some seed companies to not really have a lot of traction. Okay. Yep. So if that is the case, there, you may not even have a traction slide. And in particular, I advise just, just not have this and instead you're putting the product slide uh, so you can talk about what you're building and what the market needs are there and how are you going to solve it. So you're helping the VC imagine what the solution will be. Um, so again, if you don't have traction or your traction is weak, you don't want to hide it, but you don't want to pull the slide up to the front and spend a lot of time uh, cheering about it. <laughs> yeah. I think traction is important for growth rounds. You know, if you're doing your series A, B, C, beyond, like you say, essentially what you're saying is like, hey, we figured out our product market fit. We know how we're going to sell this thing. Look, this is the proof. Mm -hmm. uh, some early stage companies have that, but some don't. The interesting piece is there are some companies that don't necessarily have um, a measurable uh, or a attraction that can be measured in dollars or in users or something like that, but they may still have real progress. So I think what um, what you're really talking about here is whether you really fully understand your industry and what the important milestones are within that industry. Um, and if you have traction, if you have uh, revenue traction, then do you understand your business model? And I think um, it is such a useful slide to be able to poke into the various aspects of what you're building and to really kind of get, get to the meat of things, I think. That's right. And so let's talk about um, uh, how the slide might be different depending on the industry that you're in. Mm -hmm. So this is your moment to prove to the venture capitalist that you understand your industry, you understand the KPIs that are important to your industry, and it's you're basically making it clear that you're going to talk the same language as that venture capitalist is, right? The VC thinks about how a... The, the, theoretically, you're pitching somebody who knows something about your industry or at least about your business model. There are particular words that they use as they talk about how companies are growing and how companies are hot or exciting, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. You want to you kind of tap into that and make sure everybody's on the same wavelength. And to the extent that you have a KPI that's a little different, you're going to want to highlight it here so that you're not talking past each other. Okay. So, yep. you're gonna, so your purpose here is obviously showing traction proving to the VC you understand what's important in, in the industry and you're avoiding vanity metrics, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so let's, uh, 
let, let's talk a little bit about how this varies by stage of company. Um, hmm. So, hi, what about a seed stage or pre-seed even? Yeah, I think in, in the pre and seed seed stage, um, as you as you mentioned, if you have no traction, don't show traction. I feel like um, traction is kind of the most operational slide um, in this deck. And I think when you're thinking about your board meetings further down the line, the, the, the KPIs you report to your board are probably the KPIs you're going to want in this. So in the super early stages, if you're building a, um, um, you mentioned this suggestion before this call, but I'm gonna steal it from you. If you're building a med tech company and, you're, and you need like uh, approval for, um, for uh, regulatory reasons, for example, the progress through that uh, path may actually be a reportable metric. Like if you are a, uh, if you are a, a, some, a company that really has a huge breakthrough that needs extensive FDA approval, then you're, you're going to be in that, in that loop for a while. And you're not going to make any revenue. And that doesn't mean that your company isn't you know, showing incredible traction and being successful. So I think right. those are the kind of things that the type of stuff you would report to show real measurable success um, is the kind of stuff that shows up on this slide, even if that doesn't mean dollar signs. Right. And so I used to work for a venture firm that had a big biotech arm. I was not a biotech investor, but I was always fascinated when I got to sit in uh, some of the pitches just to try to see. And even at the very early stage there, like, so, so, you know, as the company is developing a drug, it starts to talk about how they're approaching regulatory approvals, which are very clear gates or milestones in terms of traction for a biotech company. But at the very early stage, you know, the traction was not around that at all. It was around what the molecules are and the thesis behind how those molecules might drive the clinical outcome that's desired and um, discussion around where the research was or uh, along the path, right? So that's kind of an extreme example of a company that, that doesn't necessarily have the sort of traction that we would think of in terms of revenue growth or user growth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that, that is, you know, each industry is gonna have their particular flavors uh, for a uh, software as a service company, which I spend a lot of time with, or a marketplace company, attraction is potentially going to have some numbers at the seed stage, but it's also possible they're very dinky. And if they're yeah. super tiny uh, and it's too early to tell, and, it, and it's just not, doesn't, it doesn't sell the company at all. You know, you don't want to hide anything, but it, it, you can just mention it somewhere else mm -hmm. in the deck, but not toward the front, uh, not like Kind of really upfront, um, and we we are sharing outlines of what we think the ideal pitch deck structure will be. So you'll want to look for our outline uh, or intro uh, podcast or YouTube videos around that to try to see kind of how we recommend you outline uh, your pitch deck. Uh, but you know, just at the seed stage, this there may not be a ton going on here. Um, yeah. Now, and I mean, you can get a little bit creative, right? So we'll talk about vanity metrics in just a moment, but I've worked with one company that does like self-driving car technology, and they were going through a regulatory process and then an OEM process. Now the regulatory process is probably going to be years and OEM. So getting the technology into production cars is anything from five to 10 years, right? And it, it is a huge amount of journey towards that. So this particular company had two metrics that I kept reporting. One was how fast can we get the self-driving car around a particular track? And so their goal was to shave off a couple of minutes every time. Uh, and basically that was a proxy for them to show that their technology was improving. It's a pretty fair proxy, right? It's, it stands to reason that if the car goes faster around a track safely, <laughs> that, um, that, that, is a, that is improval. The other thing they kept showing was like, okay, how far along are we in these discussions and conversations with our, um, with our OEM partners? And so, you know, is there a letter of intent? Is there a proof of concept? Is there a MVP type thing being tested somewhere? And they'd kind of mapped out the process from how, like at which point does this get shipped with say BMW and what are the steps to get there? And so those two things combined were actually really helpful as proxy metrics because, you know, if, if you start falling behind plan on those then that has a real impact on the business. Mm -hmm. Great. To the extent you're an industry that has users or paying customers, those are the types of metrics you want to you want to talk about at the seed yeah. stage. Again, there may not be much there, so you may not want to pull this slide forward. Uh, yeah. But I do I do pretty regularly see seed stage companies that do have legit traction, and it makes sense to show them. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing to think through here, and we're going to talk about this a little more in a second, but uh, the VCs also want to have and I like they want to feel confident that you know what numbers you need to have to raise your next round, right? When they put the money in, they want you to get somewhere, um, and that somewhere is to the next round. So, 
you want to be able to extrapolate up to what that next round is. And you want to kind of prove that you know what metrics you need for your next round, uh, which leads me to an increasingly popular uh, fundraising miles or, or, or round that I'm seeing, which is the seed extension round. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a, this is a after a seed round before a series A, I'm uh, I've seen a lot of founders start to do this now. And most of the ones that are doing this are ones that have some of the traction figured out, but not all. And in particular, a place where I see companies raise the seed extension is they have often figured out the customer acquisition side, but they have mm -hmm. like a churn issue for a software as a service product, right? And so they're coming in and they show the positives and you've got these exciting up and to the right type um, diagrams or charts, uh, but they also do mention, hey, this here is why we're raising a seed extension on A. This is the problem we have to figure out. And there may be a whole slide that talks about how they're going to figure it out, but the goal of that part or that pitch is to show, hey, I am sequentially knocking down the pins that I need to knock down to get to the next stage. And yep. so I've knocked down these few and you should feel very good about me because I figured that out. Here's the next ones. I know what they are and I've got, I'm making progress toward them and I've got a plan. Yeah. Um, and I love so, that you use that as, uh, as an example, because I'm working with a startup right now that has the exact opposite problem. They have incredible lifetime value, but they can't figure out their customer acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is they're saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to raise uh, $3 million to extend that seed extension piece. And it's like, okay, we know that once we have our customers, they generally don't churn. We make a lot of money. Now we just need to crack the nut of finding new customers. And both of those sides, it's kind of two sides of the same coin, right? Two sides of the CAC to uh, LTV arbitration piece. But if you manage to get to that, um, if you solve one half of the metric, you don't have a repeatable business model. So you're not ready for a, for a, for a, a growth round, but you've definitely found something. Right? There's, you've, there's one important piece of the puzzle that's clicked into place. And if you manage to crack the um, customer acquisition cost nut, and then you, you'd better have some slides in that deck about how you're going to do about that, exactly. what your theories are, right? Exactly. So, and it could be like, oh, are we going to do PR? Are we going to do PayDAC? Are we going to hire a sales team? Whatever the solution is, you need to have some things and then say, give me $3 million and I'll go and crack this nut. And if you have a compelling argument there, then that's actually a really good pitch. Invest, venture capitalists are used to taking risk. Right. Are used to what? taking risks. What they, <laughs> what, what they don't like is when they're, they don't like it when a founder doesn't understand that there's risk. Yeah. Right. And then when a founder doesn't have a credible plan to fix that problem or to yep. not to take care of that risk, right. To address the risk. So don't trust me. If you're hiding something, the smart investors are going to figure it out. Although maybe yep. not at the seed round, there's a lot of uh, pretty, uh, unsophisticated money from here at the seed run. But the A, which is the next one we're going to talk about, right? The series A. Yeah. And for particular industries, particularly like software as a service and a lot of the crypto companies I'm seeing, a lot of the hardware companies, you're going to have to start to have some traction here. And the traction metrics that you want to show have to be up and to the right. You've got to be able to defend the important KPIs that matter for your business. So software as a service, it's going to be user growth, customer acquisition cost, LTV, which is also part of your churn rate, your LTV to CAC, your revenue payback. Those are the metrics that are going to matter there. Yeah. Um, and it, again, it's going to vary by industry, but I'm just throwing one out. The and bear in mind that all of this is benchmarkable, right? If you're doing a hardware company, you have certain benchmarks in place typically. Uh, and companies like Cruise are really good for being able to help you there because you, know, uh, you guys work with 30, 40 companies in each of these verticals, which means that if I'm running a SaaS company and I say, hey, how am I doing? You could actually go, well, hiya. <laughs> or you need to do a little bit of extra work or you know, you're best in class. So make sure you put that on your, uh, exactly. on your slide deck. And I think it's actually really helpful to work with um, companies like Cruise or other kind of advisors who can, who can help you benchmark. If you have, so especially as a first time founder, you may look at your numbers and you don't know how good or bad it is you have it this is a good place to shout about it because you can bet that your VC will know. If you put a set of numbers in front of them, they will go, holy crap, this is amazing, right? Or eh, go and fix this because otherwise That's we right. can't invest. Getting that benchmarking in place and knowing whether or not you have good or bad numbers is crucial in order to be able to tell the story properly. Amazing. So that leads into the next point about why the slide is important. So from my perspective, when I was an investor, we always wanted to make sure the company was building a bridge to somewhere, is what we would say. So basically, we're putting money into the business, and when the, as the money's running out, the company needs to be awesome enough to raise a successful next round, which means the founder needs to know what KPIs or traction they need to raise the next round, and they have to be marching toward it. And so a purpose of this slide, it's very important 
for you to know what you need to look like at the next round. You may not put it on this slide, but if an investor starts to ask you about, I see what you have now, what will you look like in 12 months or what will you look like when you have to hit your next fundraise? This is where you prove to them that you've got your head screwed on straight, you know your industry, you know your KPIs and you know what you need to look like. Now, how do you figure out what those metrics are? So one, thank you, Hyatt. Work with someone like Cruise Consulting. We have a ton of clients who are raising money all the time. So we have some ideas here. Uh, two, ask VCs. You know, don't necessarily ask the VC you're about to pitch, like ask, you know, your friendly <laughs> VCs, your existing investors. Yeah. And then the third thing that I think is really powerful that uh, the best founders do, the best founders do this so well, is they find other founders in tangential vertical, like in like a similar industry or similar vertical who they periodically meet with and ask for advice. So they find somebody who's just a little further down the road than them, or maybe a couple, you know, a couple stages, a few years ahead in terms of growth. And they, they just ask them all sorts of questions. Like, hey, when you raised your A, what, what were your metrics? You know, when you raised your B, what were your metrics? Mm -hmm. Get to know those other founders because they can really help you be very credible so that when you're talking to the venture capitalist and you say, hey, listen, for my series B, I'm looking to have $8 million in ARR with a very low, like a churn rate of you know, sub 5% annually because my friend who's got an enterprise SaaS company and this other enterprise SaaS company all had metrics around that. And I'm pretty sure I can get there. And I feel like that's market for a B. The VC will kind of say, yes, that makes sense. Now, yeah. as we're recording this in January of uh, 2022, the market for a B is actually even hotter than that. Uh, we're not going to get into like the specific metrics here, but just being, just knowing what's common in your industry and having relationships with founders who are just a little ahead of the game with you, who can help you um, think through this and articulate what, what the KPIs are is a really smart idea. Yeah. And there's a super good um, insider tip in there, which is worth highlighting. You, you didn't quite go there, but if you make sure you have two or three founders that you talk to regularly, you know, remember they have a board, they have investors, they're out there talking to their investors. And if they see that you're doing something very special, that's an incredibly powerful way to get in front of investors. Like if an it's existing portfolio way. company jumps ahead and says, hey, have you talked to these guys over there? Because they're doing something super interesting and those numbers are impressive. You bet you're going to get a call from that VC. So, you know, I wouldn't do it for that reason, but it is a fantastic side effect to building out your network. And for the sake of spending, you know, three hours a month talking to people, 100% worth every second of your time. Agreed. That is the best way to get introduced to a venture capitalist is through somebody they've already backed. Yep. Beautiful. So this slide is, why is this slide important? So we just mentioned it, that you're proving to the, the VC what you need to look like now and that you speak the right language and you know where you're supposed to go, what your KPIs need to be. Two, you know, traction really is everything, particularly as you get further and further down the stages. So if you've got the amazing traction, you don't need anything else. This is the side you need to fundraise with, right? So this is this is it. Um, and, you know, you probably want to make sure that you've structured your fintech stack and your marketing stack, or um, if you're running clinical trials, like you've, you've structured yourself internally, that it's easy for you to produce these numbers so that when you go into a pitch meeting, uh, you have up-to-date numbers and the most accurate ones. Like no one wants to look at numbers from three months ago that like you want to, you want to try to get the really accurate ones. Yeah. You know, set yourself up to be able to be successful with the slide internally in terms of how you collect your KPIs. Yeah. And a small kind of asterisk on that. Um, absolutely. 100% make sure that this reporting uh, cadence you have is absolutely solid because um if you say something at this point that it was slightly fudged or slightly kind of jig jiggled about or whatever, um, it does happen, you, they're going to do due diligence. They will find out. And at that point, you get nailed to the wall. Be yeah. super careful that the numbers you use are the real numbers. And you, you don't get to lie. You don't get to exaggerate. These are, these are hard numbers, measurables that need to be real and correct. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. And then what the, the other reason this is important is well, what does the VC do with these numbers? Well, they have an internal rubric. They may have models that they've actually, that they're in Excel or some other type of models that they've developed. They're going to drop your KPIs into there. So it's either mentally they're clicking them into place just based on their pattern recognition or more formally, they have actual models that they put them into. And they're going to evaluate you around how you're comparing to the types of companies that they think. Uh, are successful. So this is a really very, very important uh, slide, particularly yeah. in the later stage. So let's get to doubly, the meat of this, right? And that's doubly oh. true for like the, the blue chip investors who have huge portfolios, right? And have seen companies grow through multiple stages of investments and that kind of stuff. 
um, they have an army of uh, analysts and associates who look at this stuff. And yeah. the more the more institutional the investor becomes, and the, the more um, assets they have under management, the more professional the organization becomes. The more these numbers actually do a lot of the talking for you, perfect, or against you. <laughs> so there's that. True. All right. Well, let let's let's actually get into this now. Let's let's share. So we have uh, two example slide uh, venture capital pitch deck templates available on our website, cruiseconsulting.com slash pitch deck decks. Uh, these are we have two businesses that we invented. Uh, please don't judge us on the businesses that were supposed to be slightly silly. There's the we're not starting these companies. Um, we have a, a, a consumer focused business and we have an enterprise focused business. I'm gonna share the screen for these two. Um, and uh, we feel like one of these is actually a pretty good looking um, slide and the other one is actually on the weaker side. So yep. the enterprise one, which is our, we call the four P's company uh, has good a good looking traction slide. The um, traction slide for the consumer facing business uh, which is uh, a beer delivery service is actually kind of weak. So all right, let's compare these two and talk about them and talk about what you would yeah, do if let's you were start, the companies. That, totally. That let's start with these. the weak one. Um, so this is the one for beer sub, uh, which is a super, super early stage company, right? It started in um, uh, the first half of 2018 and it's been running to the second half of 2020. So it's a relatively short uh, run for a company. Um, and they only have 30 paying customers. If you look along the bottom here, you know, in all of 2018, they had no paying customers. They only raised 300K friends and fam family round. So really, this is less of a traction slide and more of a milestones slide. And in this particular thing, what they've shown is that essentially they're building a concierge MVP. Now, concierge MVPs are super helpful to learn about your industry, right? So the founding is in there. You raised a friends and family round that's at the top. Then they hired a team from Netflix and launched in a second city. So, you know, you show that there is real progress and you can use this slide to kind of tell a um, linear uh, kind of temporal story of what happens here. Um, and there's nothing really here. You know, paying customers is 30. Nothing about this slide says a number of dollars. Uh, and, you know, it is nice explosive growth from nine to 15 to 30, but, you know, those numbers are so small and there's so much noise to signal ratio there that essentially this entire slide is worthless, which is a painful thing me for me to say, given that I made it, but, you know, it's garbage. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't so why, suggest wait, for yeah, a did, founder to go out and build with this. Since this was a made up company, you should just make these numbers grow really big, really fast. <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? So I feel like... Um, when I was working with a lot of uh, startup companies, once you have a bunch of traction, this slide becomes so easy. And a question I kept answering, and I covered this in my book, why, why this slide is so bad. But I, um, uh, you know, once you have your metrics and you understand how to tell that story, this slide becomes easy. Where it becomes really hard is for super early stage companies. And they keep hearing, you know, they keep downloading templates that have like a traction uh, slide on it. And they go, what do I put on the traction slide? Well, we've just covered that, which is don't delete it, get rid of it. Um, and I think that this is actually a funny um, side effect of writing this book essentially for first time founders who, who run into this problem. By the time you do raise a, a growth round, you probably know how to do a traction slide because you're yeah. doing your board decks, you know? True, true. Yeah. So, I mean, and as I think about this, it is an early stage business, like particularly the consumer side. I'm not sure these numbers are even that impressive. I don't think the doubling over a quarter is- No, is it really isn't impressive. So, <laughs> and it's so not even quarters, business, it's a half. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, gosh, yeah. So this business- Yeah, no, they're hasn't... awful. Okay, perfect. So now it uh, makes sense to talk about an enterprise slide. Uh, enterprise is different than consumer. So let us share this one. This is for our uh, example company, our four P's company that sells to the plumbing industry, enterprise sale, like small business enterprise sale into customers. Um, Hi, let, 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 let's talk about what we got on here. So first of all, I love having an ARR up and to the right. It's amazing. Yep. We've got users as well. Uh, this, is, this is really attractive. Um, talk about it from a design perspective. Like what's the thought process? Why does the slide look like this? Yeah. So what I really wanted to do here was to kind of cram several pieces of information into one slide. Um, I mean, for one thing, the stock image in the background makes it look plumbery. So I like that. But from the data point of view, um, you know, the, the ARR, the, the, um, annual recurring revenue is really one of the big driving forces behind any sort of SaaS company. So in this particular case, um, you can see that the uh, spend per customer uh, has gone up, right? So in um, I'm, I'm calling that out here 
as a part of the number. So it's growing from 240 to 260, 290 per month. Now, uh, in a later slide, we'll be talking about what the business model is. And we're actually uh, about to do a price change, which does really exciting thing. But because this is looking back in time, it shows what the company has done so far. And it looks like it was charging $20 per customer. And that has gradually started going up throughout the year. The other thing we're showing is the user growth. So that's the blue number um, with, the, with the bar on the right. They have grown on average 9% uh, user growth week on week. Now, 9% user growth week, week on week is really impressive. That is really exp high exponential growth when you're talking about a weekly um, level. I know that early in the early days of Y Combinator, they were saying that in, in, the, in the course of uh, Y Combinator, they wanted to see 15% uh, growth week on week. That is, <laughs> that is pretty ambitious, uh, but it does happen in super high growth uh, startups. Yeah. And so what, they, uh, what that means in, in terms of actual hard numbers here is that they grew from 20 to 530 customers in a year. That is pretty impressive growth. It's amazing. Yeah. So there's a couple of things going on here that I want to uh, talk about from a design perspective. So first of all, I love the up and to the right charts. Venture capitalists are, tend to be very visual with these types of charts. These are the charts that catch people's attention. Having something like this up front in your pitch deck and one of the first few slides will make everyone put down their phones, stop you know, doing emails or whatever, and start on focusing. So this chart is a chart that you use to get everyone to just focus on you. And you're going to have everyone's attention when you're showing a slide like this. It's yeah. really important. I've seen that happen literally, which is amazing. You know, a, a founder who throws up a slide like this and people literally lean in and put their phones away. They're like, oh, they put their phones down. Yeah. People are like, like, oh, wait a minute. Right. Exactly. Uh, it is amazing. And I think, I mean, if you think about what the VCs are doing, right, they are trying to invest their money to make a lot more money for their LPs. This is the kind of thing where they go, wait a minute, if this is what they've done so far, imagine what they can do with more money and our help. Sure. There's two pieces of a story on here. Actually, there's multiple pieces of stories. So you could spend a long time on this slide, right? Yep. So I'm going to do, I'm actually going to kind of double click on the ARR growth and I'm going to slightly contradict Haya in terms of what's happening with this company because I'm kind of thinking back to the early, remember this is a made up company, right? So it's not like, if you're an executive, you really ought to know what's going on here. We yep. invented this company for fun uh, a few months ago. So uh, I think what's actually happening with the, ARR growth is the company has introduced higher pricing tiers. So it's not that like the, um, the reason this is marching up is because they're selling into larger and larger enterprises. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice story. You have a moment to talk about how your traction is improving and because you're executing and your product is getting better, you're moving up market. So the newer customers you're bringing on, you're able to sell to bigger entities and therefore charge them more. Like it's a story that you have here. Um, and there's also a story around the CAC, which I think is really amazing. The CAC is coming down. So you could spend a while talking about that. Haya, it, when you're presenting this, yeah. do you want to have that? Do you want to tease the story here or do you want to tell the story or do you want to flip to another slide? Because there are going to be questions that can have like, why is your CAC coming down? Like people are going to add, like the VCs going to be like, whoa, it's great improvement. Like right. you, you cut it by a third, how? Yeah, totally. And I think blended CAC is an interesting one, right? So blended CAC, in case you're not familiar with that, uh, means the customer acquisition cost across all channels. So all your marketing spend, all your advertising spend, all your everything you add up, and then you divide it by the number of um, uh, by, by number of customers, and then you get a number. Now, you typically break that down further, right? Paid acquisition costs tend to be very high. Earned media and word of mouth tend to be almost nothing. So, you know, the blended CAC is a really good approximation for this. But if you really start talking about how you're going to in, improve your CAC further, which is, I'm literally put it on the slide here, right? More improvements to come. You will want to see a separate slide for, okay, what's the plan here? What, which channels did you find where the customer acquisition cost is surprisingly low or you know, particularly low at least? Uh, and then from that point of view, how are you going to start amplifying, uh, amplifying those channels specifically? And I think right. it, you would definitely flick, flick to another um, slide specifically about your go-to-market or about your customer acquisition cost or something like that. But on this traction slide, um, your blended CAC going down is important traction. Same as uh, ARR growth, same as um, uh, per customer spend, uh, and of course, your user growth. So I think all of these four metrics are, each of them individually are impressive, but together they tell a story of a company that has found something that really works in its own market. Yeah, this, is, this slide is showing execution. And again, in terms of managing the meeting, 
there are any of these bullets could make the venture capitalists start to try to dive in and go yep. deep to figure out what's going on there because it'll be exciting to them. Uh, and so just keep in mind that uh, you want to make sure that as you're presenting this slide, they know the most important things that up into the right revenue, up into the right user growth, right? And yep. so if they cut you off, like on this 9%, oh, 9% is great. How are you doing that? And you're like, well, hey, I'm, first of all, I'm proud of that because our ARR per customer is also going up. So revenue is like ARR growth is huge and our CAC is even getting better. So it sounds like you want to learn about like, how are we, how's the sales and marketing engine firing so well? Should we, should we just jump to that slide right now? But don't like, as you, as you answer their question and don't forget to answer their question, as you answer their question and potentially go to another slide, don't forget to do the humble brag around the revenue growth part. Okay. Yeah. So if they, if they latch onto that, just don't forget, because you want them to come away with that revenue growth number after the meeting as well. Yeah. And the thing that I might suggest is worth highlighting in particular, because there's two numbers here that show uh, uh, change over the course of the year, right? So the blended CAC started at $300 and the average ARR spend per customer started at 240 which means at that point in one year, in the first year, you're losing money on a customer. Towards the end of the year, the numbers are 220 for acquisition and 290 for spend. And the story you're really telling there is like, hey, those lines have crossed over. We went from losing money in the first year uh, on the average customer to making money on the average customer. That I think is the real highlight of this particular slide. And that's something that you can point out or what, what is really amazing for storytelling, if the uh, investor actually notices and tells you, you, you can sit there and smile and nod and go like, yep, that's what we did. It's right. a really good storytelling um, uh, point. And with these kind of things, a lot of in, uh, investors are incredibly finance forward. You know, they, That's what they do day in, day out. They will notice. And if they point it out to you, you you've scored yourself a bunch of points there. Yeah, so that does speak to understanding what metrics you need to know. So for SaaS companies, revenue payback, so how long it takes you, sorry, um, uh, sales and marketing payback, so CAC payback period matters quite a bit. Uh, and so essentially what that is, is you spend a certain amount on sales and marketing to acquire a new customer. How many months of revenue do you need to pay it back? Now, yeah. I could get pretty deep in the philosophy here where I'm seeing a lot of VCs make mistakes with that number because some VCs are investing in services, businesses that may be subscription, but have low gross margins. I think those VCs should not be using revenue. They should be doing a gross profit payback period, but hey, <laughs> no, it's not my money. But anyway, I do, think, I do think a lot of VCs in a year or two are going to be a little disappointed when they realize that they didn't yeah. do very good math there. Well, and um, I think it is also worth pointing out that there is an important number missing from this slide. It doesn't say anything about churn and it doesn't say anything about lifetime value right? Mm -hmm. So those two are, are very closely uh, related. So all of these numbers could be true, but if, if you are losing customers faster than you're making them, uh, then your customer acquisition cost suddenly becomes really important. Now, if this business turns out to be super sticky, so once they sign up, they're not going to leave for 10 years, then at that point, you have a really important and really powerful business here. Now, the right. truth is that a lot of these early stage businesses, you just don't know how long your customers are going to stay around. You know, the early, the early churn will start happening, but, you know, if your business has only been around for one year, you can't project much more further into the future than that because you just don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, let's for a second talk about the different metrics that can be on this page. But I do want to throw a little tidbit out here. Uh, if you were an early stage company and you've only had a few customers churn, I suggest, I don't suggest, I strongly tell the founder that they need to know the names of the folks that churned and the reason why. So if yes. you if your customer if your client your company is relatively new and you've only had five clients churn, know who those people are and know why, right? So for this business, if I had churn, I would say, listen, we've had ten companies churn, four of them went out of business, um, one of them the like founder lost his phone and decided he didn't want to use it, uh, three of them didn't they're missing these features, so we've got that on our roadmap, and then two others, uh, you know, I don't know what that would be, but basically, like I would I would literally know. Every single one, I would know their names and I would be I would have a really good reason to explain why they turned. Yeah. Okay. And that is and, and that is so 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 I I'm just saying the same as you now, but that is so important, especially in kind of uh, enterprise businesses with relatively low numbers of customers. You know, if Instagram churns some customers, you know, they they may throw a a survey your way, but they don't really care about the individuals. But here, especially in the early days of this, you know, we have less than 100 customers. There's no excuse for not knowing your customers pretty well. 
Exactly right. And and for a consumer business that has a lot of users, you should like you should say, hey, we have I've talked to X or we've done surveys. Here's why people are leaving. One hundred percent. Right. Yep. So you need to know this. Uh, other metrics that you can put onto the slide. So obviously, revenue's king. Uh, which again does not matter for a biotech company or maybe some hardware companies that you have, have yet to launch a product right because they're still producing it uh, but revenue deposits or pre-orders subscriptions yep. people committing dollars like actually dollars coming into your business that is the ultimate form of traction other other things are like user acquisition metrics and then um, how you, you like to talk about leading indicators for a business. And this, this helps you prove what, that you know what the KPIs are for your business and you understand whatever funnel drives to like the right traction. You want to talk about some of those? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the challenges you have with traction is that it's all you're standing where you're standing and you're looking back, right? And the hope is, can you figure out a, a metric that actually helps you look forward? So like, can you predict the future using some of these metrics? Uh, those are called leading metrics. And the idea... Like looking at this graph and I see what's happening here when, when, where customers and revenue are uh, going up pretty much in lockstep, it isn't completely unreasonable to overlay another graph on this, which is marketing spend, right? And if your marketing spend actually goes up in, in a similar kind of graph as these, then you can very realistically say to an investor like, hey, our marketing spend goes up at the same pace as our user growth, which means if we 10x our marketing spend, our user growth will probably 10x as well. We did an experiment. We tried for a couple of weeks to spend a little bit extra, and it looks like that is true. That makes for a really compelling argument that you have a tap that you can turn on for rapid user growth and turn it back down when you need to kind of focus on product or whatever. And then yes. you can have a conversation with your investors about, hey, where do you think is most strategically important right now? Should we go for hyper growth with customers? In which case, give us $10 million and we'll spend it on ads and we'll get those customers. Or are we building something else here? Are we building product? Are we building team? Are we, like, what, where do we focus? And that makes for a really interesting strategic conversation with your board. But it also means that you have a few levers you can pull that has a direct uh, impact on how your business grows. Exactly. That's right. And so thinking about other metrics that you could use depending on an industry, like you mentioned the CAC, LTV, sales pipeline, potentially yep. if you're selling into large enterprises. Yeah. Um, well, and some actually, of them, go on. Oh, I, I, want, I want to think about, um, you know, you mentioned a, a self, I think it was some sort of self-driving car technology. So like logos of um, let's, let's say, you know, you hadn't finished your product yet, but uh, Toyota and BMW and Ford had had paid you, you know, hundred thousand dollars each for some sort of development contract or something. Just putting those logos on there, yeah, right. It's like, hey, we haven't finished our product, but these, like, basically the biggest companies in the world that could be our customers are already paying us money because they're so bought into what we're doing. Yeah, like that is that is a traction slide that actually works for a company that doesn't have like that hardcore product revenue traction yet. Yeah. And you can think about um, macro metrics too. So uh, things that are happening outside of your business. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, if you are um, if you are Netflix, and suddenly the unemployment ro uh, rate spikes because, say, there's a pandemic or something, there's a pretty good chance that if you're running a cinema, that's a leading indicator for you having a very bad time. If you are Netflix, that's a leading indicator for you having a great time because people yeah. still need to fill their time with something, and Netflix is a lot cheaper than going to the cinema, for example, also lower investment risk. So you exactly. can have some of those things. Or if you are, if you are a company that is operating in the uh, EV charger space and you see EVs increasing rapidly, that's probably a sign that you know, there will be like a little lag while people figure out how they want their uh, charging situation to be. There's a pretty good chance that your market is about to grow exponentially when EV sales go up exponentially. And exactly. if you're able to prove that, like, hey, we've studied this over the five years, there's a six month lag, but when there's a spike in sales, there's also a spike in chargers. So we think that becomes a really good leading indicator for where you think your business is going to go. You can back it up with real data. That doesn't mean you've made any sales yet, but over time, as, you, as your sales start mirroring that, then you can use that as a leading indicator for where you're going. Uh, and later fund, funding rounds in particular, you can get more aggressive about how much money you raise because you can say with a certain amount of certainty, like, hey, we see this happening. We think that is going to mean X, Y, Z. Sounds great. Good. 
Uh, and then I just want to make sure we're listing a couple other metrics that might make sense. Downloads may make sense. Installs may make sense. Monthly or daily active users may make sense depending on your industry. Yeah. But then that gets us to our next point, which is you do want to avoid vanity metrics, metrics yep. that are just big and up to the right that mean nothing for your business. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Um, yeah. And I always think that if your metric doesn't have a direct um, impact on your bottom line or on one of your indicators you do care about, they're vanity metrics. It doesn't matter that your website suddenly has a 10x spike in traffic. If it doesn't equate in some sort of uh, extra amount of sales, it's just cost to you, right? Right. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you get inquiries, for example, for sales, if you suddenly get 30 times more inquiries, that's a real cost. Somebody has to sit there and reply to all those emails. But at the same time, if that doesn't convert it to sales, you know, it doesn't matter. Same thing, like we can get super meta here, right? This very podcast, this very uh, video series costs us time and money to make. And if that doesn't convert into, say, sales for cruise or, you know, book sales for me, then that doesn't, it, it's a waste of time all around. Now, I really believe that I will do both of those things. So that's great. But, you know, you have to, you have to measure the right thing and hand on heart, be honest with yourself. It feels great to get uh, press coverage. It feels fantastic to get a bunch of customer inquiries. If those things don't convert into business metrics you care about, you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. And it, it's some, I've seen a lot of founders do this. They report, oh, look, we got coverage here and coverage there. It looks sexy and it's fun to share on, on LinkedIn, but it's not actually going to move your business along. So That's avoid right. those if you can. Right. Other things are to not ignore problem areas in the business, like high churn rates, um, you know, problems you're having with your scientific discovery. You, you want to, again, during diligence, good VCs should figure this stuff out. Um, so, so don't, don't ignore those issues. Make sure you're ready to address them. Make sure you have a plan to fix them. Just be ready. Yep. Uh, well, I think we've done a nice job talking through this slide. Hi, anything you think we missed? I think that seems pretty comprehensive, you know? That's great. That's good. Well then let's, uh, let's, let's wrap this up here. So, you know, the traction slide is quite possibly the most important slide. If you have good traction, you should be able to raise you should if hopefully you're develop the internal controls and systems and operating procedures you need to easily collect the KPIs you're going to put onto this slide. Yeah. Uh, if if you're doing well, don't don't bury the lead. This is the lead. Get it up near the front of your deck. Get yeah. ready to talk about it. Get excited. Know the KPIs in your industry so that you're not talking about the wrong stuff or looking like an idiot. Know what you need to look like in the next round with these KPIs so that the VC has faith that you you, you know where you're supposed to be pointed. Um, and just be excited. This is a really great slide. Now, if, if you don't have the traction yet, this is not the slide you want to highlight. You're going to want to go with like a product slide or market slide up front. Uh, but, and then you'll definitely want to have a plan to address any of the issues or knock down the milestones you need to get to. And, and any other thoughts you're high? I feel like, uh, I, feel I like think that's pretty here. much it. I think, you know, it's, there's like a hierarchy here, right? If you have revenue traction, that is everything. If you have other important traction, that is everything. If you have nothing, don't use the slide. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Again, cruiseconsulting.com uh, slash pitch dash deck for our free templates. And we are doing a series here. So stay tuned for the next one. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you.